When people think of vampires, they usually think of the famous fictional bloodsucker Dracula. But there have been plenty of vampire tales that stemmed from real life events or people. In this video, we count down five alleged cases of real vampires. Back in the 1700s, vampire hysteria was all over Europe. Many were afraid of vampires rising from the grave to feed upon them and their loved ones. In 1725 in the village of Kisilava, Serbia, a farmer by the name of Peter died but didn't stay dead. Three days after his death, Peter returned from the grave, appearing before his son and demanding food. His son fed him, but the next night when Peter returned asking for more, the son refused him, so Peter left. The next morning, the son was found dead and after a few days, nine more people from the village were found dead. Before their death, each of these villagers complained of exhaustion and appeared to have lost large amounts of blood. If that wasn't suspicious enough, they also all claimed to have dreamed of being visited by Peter. Greatly alarmed by these events, the parish priest wrote to a local magistrate, who passed on the news to a nearby commander of Imperial troops. He, two officers and an executioner arrived shortly after receiving the message and they promptly set to exhuming the corpses of all who had died. What they found in Peter's grave shocked everyone. Peter's corpse was perfectly preserved and his mouth was covered in blood. After the discovery, a stake was pounded into Peter's chest. After this, they burned his body to ash and then moved on to the bodies of Peter's victims. These were reburied with the normal preventative measures, garlic and whitethorn placed with each corpse in the grave. This case begins with a herdsman named Mislata of Blow that continued to return to the town even after his death. The undead Mislata would wander the streets while calling out the names of those he recognised as he passed them by. Town officials felt it was needed to take out the threat, so the body of the Blow vampire was exhumed, and a stake was pounded into its heart. Unfortunately, that didn't do the trick, and the vampire returned in a horrifying state, frightening several villagers to death and then suffocating others. The vampire laughed at those that attacked him and even mocked them. Now absolutely desperate, the villagers gave the vampire's sleeping body to an executioner who pierced it with several whitethorn stakes. Once he was finished, he then burned it. While the flames consumed the vampire, suffering screams of the undead could be heard by all. In 1582, residents in a village in Silesia complained of visitations from a bad breath vampire named Canisius. Before joining the ranks of the undead, Johannes Canisius had been a respected citizen. In February 1582, Canisius was fatally injured after being kicked by one of his horses. Before expiring, Canisius lingered for several days, complaining of ghostly visions and feeling like he was on fire. According to one witness, at the time of his death, a black cat entered the room and jumped onto his bed. As befitted his civic status, Canisius was entombed near the altar of his local church. But within a few days, several townspeople reported receiving visits from the dead man. All described a deathly stink and an exceedingly cold breath. This smell was believed to be intolerable. The people tolerated these nocturnal visits until late July, when they resolved to exhume Canisius' coffin and deal with his wandering corpse. They found that his skin was tender and florid. His joints were not stiff but limber and movable. When they opened a vein in his leg, the blood sprang out fresh as in the living. After a brief hearing, Canisius' body was thrown onto a bonfire and burned, then hacked to pieces and crushed to ashes. As might be expected, the spirit of Canisius ceased its nocturnal visits. The Phantom of Grogling Grange is one of the best known vampire stories in Britain. Legend tells that Grogling Grange was in the hands of the Fisher family for many centuries. In the early 19th century, the Fishers moved from the property into larger dwellings and put the property up to let. All during the cold long winter, the house was empty. As the winter passed into spring, the Grange was finally let to two brothers and a sister called the Craneswells. It seems that they enjoyed life to the full and soon settled into village routine and socialized with the local people. They were well liked within the village and loved their new home very much. One summer's evening, Miss Cranswell looked out the window in the direction of the darkened churchyard at the bottom of their long lawn, and noticed something peculiar in the vicinity of the churchyard. It seemed that above the darker blackness of the gravestone, she could see two points of lights moving. In time, they moved from the graveyard over the shadows of the wall, moving closer onto the bottom of the lawn where they played around the churchyard wall. 
By this time, Miss Cranswell's curiosity had given way to a deep feeling of unease. She closed the window tight, bolted the door, and laid down in her bed to try and get some sleep. On the verge of sleep, she was suddenly jolted awake by the low rustling from outside the window. She twisted in bed and sat upright. Outside the window were two points of light which she now recognized as the vampire's eyes. She tried to scream but terror froze the sound in her throat. He stepped to the bed and in one movement grabbed her hair and pulled her head back as if to deliver a kiss. The brothers sleeping in separate rooms were aroused by a loud high-pitched scream that seemed to shake the very walls of the Grange. In a moment they were before their sister's door. The door was locked, so they smashed through it, breaking into a devastating scene. There was a stench of mouldy decay in the air, and upon the bed lay their sister, blood pumping from gashes in her neck. One of the brothers rushed to the open window and just caught sight of a shadow flittering across the bottom of the lawn near the churchyard. They managed to stop the blood and revive Miss Cranswell. The next few hours were spent in an attempt to save her life. Miss Cranswell survived the attack and when she was strong enough to travel, they took her to Switzerland to recuperate in the fresh mountain air. When the full story was in the open, the brothers swore revenge on the creature. So it came to be that the Cranswells returned to Crogley in one dark winter's day. Miss Cranswell took her place in the room overlooking the churchyard, and as the moon rose, a pair of bright lights shone in the shadows of the churchyard. Once more, the figure of a man appeared at the window and picked the glass to gain entry to the bedchamber. This time, the two brothers were lying in wait in the shadows. As the figure came to step into the room, they both released really shots at the creature. There was a low howl and the creature sped off in the direction from where it came. Not wishing to follow such a night creature into its domain, the two brothers waited for daybreak. First thing in the morning, they took Miss Cranswell to safety and gathered all the residents of the Grange around them to carry out their gruesome task. The men searched the graveyard for any signs of disturbance. On finding none, they turned their attention to the church. All was quiet, but they noticed the door was slightly ajar. Pushing into the crypt, they was met with a horrific scene. All around the crypt were the scattered remains of broken coffins and gnawed human bones. One coffin stood alone in the corner and seemed to have been left untouched by the chaos. The villagers wrenched off the coffin lid. Inside, wrapped in moldy clothes, was what they assumed to be a vampire. Its eyes were cold and lifeless in the daylight but a fresh pistol wound was gaping from one of the creature's legs. The villagers dragged the coffin and its demonic contents out into the churchyard and burned the lot to ashes. Nobody seems to know where this strange creature came from, or why it had remained dormant in the centuries of peace when the fishers lived in the property. One can only surmise that during the period of dereliction, an age-old horror was reawakened and would not return to rest after the house was reoccupied. She has been described as the most vicious female serial killer in all recorded history. Born in 1560, she was endowed with looks, wealth, an excellent education and a stellar social position as one of the Bathory family, who ruled Transylvania as a virtually independent principality within the Kingdom of Hungary. When she was 11 or 12, Elizabeth was betrothed to Ferenc Nadezdi, but a year or two later she had a baby by a lower order lover. Nadezdi was reported to have him castrated and then torn to pieces by dogs. The child was quietly hidden from view, and Elizabeth and Nadezhdi were married in 1575 when she was 14. Because Elizabeth socially outranked her husband, she kept the surname Bathory, which he added to his own. The young couple lived in the Nadezhdi castle in Hungary, but Nadezhdi was an ambitious soldier and was often away. Elizabeth ran the estates, took various lovers and bore her husband four children, Word was beginning to spread about her sadistic activities. It was said that she enjoyed torturing and killing young girls. At first they were servants at her castles, daughters of the local peasants, but later they included girls sent to her by local families to learn good manners. She believed that drinking the blood of young girls would preserve her youthfulness and her looks. Witnesses told of her stabbing victims or biting their breasts, hands, faces and arms, cutting them with scissors, sticking needles in their lips or burning them with red hot irons. Some were beaten to death and some were starved. A minister went to the Hungarian authorities, who eventually began an investigation in 1610. Elizabeth was placed in solitary confinement, with only small slits left open for ventilation and the passing of food. She remained there for four years until her death. On the evening of the 21st of August 1614, 
Elizabeth complained to her bodyguard that her hands were cold, whereupon he replied, it's nothing mistress, just go lie down. She went to sleep and was found dead the following morning. So that was five dark cases of vampires. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more countdown videos.